जय गुरुदेव so we'll begin reading page 262 now before we go ahead any questions any concerns everybody is up to speed okay good chal who's going to start reading 262 somebody who has not been reading for a long time so this is more like a repetition but he is explaining a little in detail here the mountain seen in a dream only appears to exist in time and space it does not occupy any space nor does it take time to appear and disappear correct we have all experienced this in a dream a mountain is there and suddenly it's not there Yeah, it doesn't take time to appear or disappear. Yeah, it just appears to exist, but it is not really existent. Just like that is this the case of this world. In whatever manner the omnipotent deity comes into being, in exactly the same manner, a worm also comes into being within the twinkling of an eye. So he is saying it doesn't matter whether it is a deva or it is a little worm on this bhuloka. It doesn't matter in which loka you come into existence. Yeah, it takes the same amount of time, the twinkling of an eye, to come into existence. So now to come into existence, what really happens to you? you are in that pool of consciousness yeah and you just say i the moment you say i you jump out it doesn't matter whether this i said i want to be a deva or this i said i want to be a worm it doesn't matter it's that twinkling of an eye in which you jump out of the pool of consciousness yes one more clarification somebody was saying oh so it is the beginning of creation so before the beginning what was there where was i if i was the pool of consciousness then there was no creation oh, this is a misunderstanding the beginning of creation is the beginning of creation of this i yeah this i came out and goes through several birth death birth death birth death it keeps you know struggling in samsara there must be another little drop in this pool which remains there yeah this i might after several birth and death come back in here but maybe that time it is the chance of this other dot if one other drop to go out so it is the beginning of whose creation the creation of i yeah because it is anadi it is ananta it is continuous yeah so there is no one 
single beginning of creation for all. Yeah, it's not a single point of time. Time does not really exist. Yeah, so be very clear about this. It is the beginning of the creation of this I. This I came out of that pool of consciousness. So it is the advent of creation of this I. Clear? So can there be multiple eyes? Yeah, there are multiple eyes, no? I, I and you are also I and she is also I and he is also I. These are all multiple eyes that have come out at different points of time, if you want to call it time. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe I am still, you know, I have another hundred births to go. Another person has only one or two more lifetimes to go. And another person may have 10,000 lifetimes to go. So everybody started at their own point. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, all, it's, it's never that at the beginning of creation there was a single pool and we were all in it at the same time. Doesn't. That is just a concept. Yeah, it's for the, uh, for the sake of clarification that we use this pool of consciousness to help you understand what it is. Good. The jiva thinks of itself as creator, preserver and so on. But all this is nothing more than thought form. I is nothing but a thought form. I want to be this is just thought form. However, this thought form conceives and perceives other thought forms and experiences them. Yeah, the moment I say I, I imply there is a you or the other. The moment I have implied, I will start experiencing you. So I is also thought form, you is also thought form. Yeah. So recognize this, that this creation of I and you is simultaneous. Happens at the same time. Yeah. Now extending this understanding from the beginning of creation, we extend it to all the lifetimes. Then why do I go through these several lifetimes? Because I've created desires. My desire of I want to do this or I want to become this. It might not be in my karma phalam to experience it right now. But because I threw out that seed, I threw out another thought form which I will have to experience. Yeah? Maybe I will not experience exactly as I want it. Yeah? But it will come to me in some or the other form as my karma phalam. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you will experience your own thought form. There is no other way out of this cycle. Yeah. So if you want to cut this cycle, you want to stop this continuous cycle, what do you have to stop? The thought form. And what is the thought form? Nothing but desire. I want this or I don't want this. Both. Yeah. Both of these need to be cut off for you to stop being in this cycle. Okay? Yeah. We'll read ahead now. Oh Rama, the material jiva perceives the material world on account of the material influence of the unreality. In all this what this what can be considered as real and what as unreal. An imaginary object is imaginatively described by someone and one understands in one's own imagination and imagines that he understands it. Just as liquidity is in liquids, motion in winds, emptiness in space, even so is omnipresence in the self. From the time the Lord instructed me, I have been performing the worship of the infinite self. By the grace of such worship, 
membership, though I am constantly engaged in the various activities, I am free from sorrow. I perform the worship of the Son, who is undivided, though apparently divided. With the flowers of whatever comes to me, naturally I whatever actions are natural to me. To come into relationship, to possess and to be possessed is common to all employed beings. But the yogi is forever vigilant and such vigilance is in the worship of the self. Adopting this inner attitude and with a mind utterly devoid of any attachment, I roam in this dreadful forest of samsara, world appearance. If you do so, you will not suffer. Okay. He has very beautifully described it in the second paragraph. The unreal jiva perceives the unreal world on account of the unreal influence of the unreality. Amazing, na? That is like the most beautiful description of Maya. It is all unreal, but still it can completely overwhelm me, control me as if it is real. Yeah. I perceive this unreal world as real and that's why he says, no, in all this what can be considered as real and what as unreal. An imaginary object is imaginatively described by someone. This is very apt definition. I see a dream. It's my imagination. I come and describe my dream to you. Yeah? What do you really understand? You start imagining what I imagined. Yeah? So... And one understands in one's own imagination and imagines that he understands it. So even you understanding my dream is your own imagination. Just as liquidity is in liquids, motion in wind, emptiness in space, even so is omnipresence in the self. It's so beautiful, so beautifully described. Yeah. It is all an imagination. From the time the Lord instructed me, I have been performing the worship of the infinite self. By the grace of such worship, though I am constantly engaged in the various activities, I am free from sorrow. Now let's see why is he free from sorrow and why are we not free from sorrow? He says, I perform the worship of the self who is undivided, though apparently divided, with the flowers of whatever comes to me naturally and whatever actions are natural to me. What is the meaning of whatever comes to me naturally? Without seeing. Perfect, perfect. Without desiring, without seeking, without that feverish running race that is there constantly in the mind. When I free myself, I decide to get out of this race. I decide to stop running this mad race and just be. Then you will notice, oh, you cannot but be because life is flowing and it is making you flow. Yeah, You cannot stop because you have this fear that oh, if I stop seeking or I stop running this race, how will life flow? Life will stop. But this is your own imagination. You think that you are giving life its direction. No. It is life that is giving you direction. Yeah. It's like you are simply running inside a train which is anyways moving. Yeah. You have to just realize that this train is moving 
and it's moving of its own accord. It's not moving because I am running inside the train. Yeah? You have to just stop. Stop that seeking. Stop desiring. Just be. And you will notice, oh, it still continues. Life still continues. Actions still happen. Things still naturally come my way. Yeah? Karma of mine, Sanchita Karma from the past, naturally unfolds. Yeah? Naturally, that job comes my way. I have to do that particular task. I don't have to desire to do that task. Yeah? That particular business proposition comes my way. I am propelled into that direction. I don't have to be feverish about getting that particular business deal or job or whatever, name, fame, getting married. You don't have to keep running behind this thing. Yeah? You stop and you just observe life. The moment you stop, you stand still, you will observe, oh, the train is moving. And it's moving of its own accord. It does not require your orders to move. Yeah. This is the most difficult thing that people cannot really yeah. understand. But there is only one way to understand. Stop running inside the train. There is no other way to understand it. Yeah? To stop running inside the train, you have to drop that fear. Yeah? And just be. Drop seeking. Drop wanting. Drop desiring. Just be. Yeah? It's basically that we're stuck in to a ship, right? We always yeah. think we're doing it. Our I... I, or something. We just had a science course and Jeff shared a quote from one of Guruji's knowledge sheets and the quote says that live as if you don't exist. Perfect. So yes. it's very apt. Yes. That same quote. Yes. We did. Share that in that group. Yeah. We did that in Ashtavakra too. Yeah. Guruji had said in Ashtavakra, live as if you don't exist. You take this as homework. Can I just for one week not desire? Yeah? Can I drop this feverish running race in my head? Yeah, it's that imaginary race in your head that you are running. That is what is the cause of your dukkha. There is no other cause of dukkha. And Dukkha is not sorrow the way you interpret it. Yeah. Just coming into this body is Dukkha. Even if you don't see it yet. Even if you think it is Dukkha. And just coming into this body, being born in a physical form is Dukkha. Yeah. Somebody went to Buddha and said, you know, you keep preaching Everything is Dukkha, everything is Dukkha. But I can't see it. I mean, for a moment when I'm sitting here in the satsang with you, I understand it. I completely accept it. The moment I go home, I meet my beautiful wife and my lovely kids and I see my house, all that Dukkha Ukkha vanishes. I'm very happy. Yeah. Why can't I see the truth, the reality? Consistently, persistently, ceaselessly. Why is it just a little momentary realization and it goes away? Why can't I see it the way you see it? So Buddha said, By me realizing that it is Dukkha, how will you realize? You cannot realize by my words. It has to be your experience. Yeah, we've learned it that Buddha believed just in pure experiencing everything. Yeah. He said that if the day comes, if you're lucky enough, if that day comes that you realize that it, 
everything is dukkha, you will just take a leap of faith out of it. You won't stop to ask me this question, is this dukkha? And he said, I'll give you an example. If your house is on fire, are you going to call me and ask me, should I get out of this house now? No, you're just going to jump out of that house. Yeah, because it's on fire. Like that, this whole samsara is on fire for me. And I am not interested at all in this rat race. It is all Dukkha. Yeah? So you wait for your day. One day you will realize that everything is burning. Yeah? You come to it by your own experience. From the time the Lord instructed me, I have been performing the worship of the infinite self. By the grace of such worship, though I am constantly engaged in various activities, I am free from sorrow. Yeah? That's how Vashishta is free from sorrow because he has taken that jump out of that fire. He has experienced that it is fire. I perform the worship of the self who is undivided, though apparently divided, with the flowers of whatever comes to me naturally and whatever actions are natural to me. Yeah. So just be natural. Whatever comes, be with that this week. Yeah. Drop desiring. Let life flow naturally to you. To come into relationship is common to all embodied beings. And what is relationship? To possess and to be possessed. Yeah? Did you ever think that is the true meaning of relationship? Yeah? You want to possess somebody. Mine. You want to say mine. My mother, my father, my brother. My sister, my spouse, my kids. Yeah? The moment I want to say my, there is this desire to possess and to be possessed. I want to belong to her or him. Yeah? This is something that happens naturally yeah? to all beings. But what does the yogi do? He's forever vigilant. And such vigilance is the worship of the self. Yeah. Initially he said meditation with closed eyes is the worship of the self. Then he said walking, talking, open eyed, being meditative in everything, daily routine is a higher form of worship of the self. And now third, what is he saying? What is the worship of the self? Being vigilant yeah, in this samsara. Away from this desire to possess or to be possessed. This is worship of the self. Yeah? Homework number two for you. Just observe. Just observe your own relationships. Isn't it just a desire to either possess him or her or to be possessed by him or her? Yeah. And can I cut that, that emotional string of wanting to possess or wanting to be possessed? Just cut it from my side. That does not mean I stop being with the person. You be with that person, but no strings attached. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Keep observing. Be vigilant. Adopting this inner attitude and with the mind utterly devoid of any attachment, I roam in this dreadful forest of samsara or world appearance. If you do so, you will not suffer. 
He's directly told you this. If you can be vigilant and drop that desire to possess or be possessed by somebody else, you will not suffer in this samsara. Yeah. So you take this up. Can I let go of this desire? Can I really look deep within? I don't have to drop that relationship. I have to live with that person. Yeah? Exactly the way I was before. But from my side, that attachment that I have, that can I let go? Can I just drop it? Yeah? You want to read ahead now? Yeah. With great sorrow, like the loss of wealth and relatives, we false you inquire into the nature of truth in the manner described. You will not be affected by joy or sorrow. You now When great sorrow befalls you, inquire into the nature of truth in the manner described. So great loss, he has given example of loss of wealth, loss of a relative. What should you do? Just inquire into the nature of truth then. And you will not be affected by joy or sorrow. You now know how all these things arise and how they cease. And you also know the fate of the man who is deluded by them, who does not inquire into the real nature. Yeah. So what is the meaning of inquiring into the real nature? What is the meaning of seeing the truth as it is? If a relative of yours passes away, just look at it as it is. This body had come into being a for its own karma, whatever its own karma was. And it has exhausted that karma and it has left. That is the truth. What do you see? Really? No, my this, my that, he left or she left. Oh, how am I going to be without this person? This is all Manohar Kahaniya created by the mind. All attachments. It has all got to do with you. Yeah? It is a selfish need. How am I going to live without him or her? There is no selflessness there. You are not really thinking about that person who passed away. Yeah? If you could look at reality as it is when someone passes away, actually it is, um, it is a chance for you to celebrate somebody's karma expiry. Maybe the person has gone back to the pool of consciousness. How do you know? Yeah. So drop this thing of crying and moaning when somebody moves on. Or even if there is a loss. Even if you lose your wealth, you lose a job, you lose a few things, you lose one Girls lose one little earring or necklace. Full day you sit and cry. Are you good? One karma exchange over. Finished. You're done with it. You paid off 
some mortgage, some balance that was remaining. Yeah. Look at reality as it is. This was my karma. The karma has expired. Fantastic. Done. Over and out. Stop looking back. Move on. Nature of reality is that nothing belongs to you and you do not belong to anything or anyone. However close you are in your relationship, homework number three for you. However close your husband, wife, whatever, mother, father, friend, sister, brother, whatever relations, really look. You might feel you are very, very close, but still inside, somewhere deep inside, you have this feeling that I am separate. I do not have anything to do with this person. There is that sense of vairagya deep inside you. There is no mind in this relationship. It is only at a superficial level that I see it as mine. So wherever you say, my house, my husband, my wife, my child, just see, really is it mine? Yeah. Observe. Observe your own self. Look at the truth of reality as it is. Yeah. So highlight that they do not belong to you. You do not belong to them. That is the truth he is telling you to inquire into. To look into very sincerely. Such is the unreal nature of the world. And do not grieve. After looking at the truth, you tend to start feeling all sad about it. There's nothing to feel sad about. It is what it is. Yeah? The mind creates all these Manohar Kahani. Yeah? All these um, Alice in Wonderland stories in the head. Yeah? Drop these stories and look at the truth of nature as it is. Dear Rama, you are pure consciousness which is not affected by the illusory perception of the diversity of creation. If you see this, how will notions of the desirable and undesirable arise in you? Realizing thus, O Rama, remain established in the Turiya state of consciousness. Yeah? I am that pool of consciousness. I am not separate from it. Yeah? Everything that came out from that pool of consciousness is actually just that. So how can I say, oh this one little drop I like and that one little drop I don't like. You can't have desirable and undesirable. It is one pool of consciousness. Yeah? You have a glass of water. You can't say, I like the water at the bottom and I don't like the water at the top. It's the same water. There is no desirable and undesirable water there, right? Just like that. Yeah. Drop this. Yeah. Actually, this consciousness is undivided. It's it, only yes. Correct. Even mind and intellect is not born. It is imagination. Just like you sleep in the night. No, you see a dream. Yeah, in that Aruna becomes young again and is a teenager going to school. But really, is that true? That's not true. Yeah, when you wake up, that does not exist. Just like that. This entire creation. You and I discussing Yoga Vashishta. This is all a dream. It does not exist. So even mind and intellect are not born. All this is a dream. Yes. That is why it is called Maya. Yeah? And where is this Maya happening? In the pool of consciousness only. Yeah. It is... The nature of 
the consciousness itself. Yeah. If you realize this, he says, O Rama, you will remain established in the Turiya Avastha, the Turiya state. And Rama says, By your grace, O Lord, I am free from the dirt of duality. Duality is I and you, I and the other. I have realized that all this is indeed Brahman. Who's going to read the next page? So vigilance is like being alert all the time, really aware, oh now a desire has come, my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, mine, that my wants to go out and fulfill some desire. Yeah, so observing that a yogi is very vigilant. Oh, another seeking has arisen. Oh, another desire has arisen right now. Yeah? Let me not um, give serve that little desire tea. Yeah? Let that desire come and go. What do we do? When thoughts come, we serve them tea. Yeah? It means you start an internal dialogue and you become feverish about that thought and then you want to put it in action and then you're con continuously thinking about it. This is the meaning of serving the thought stay. Yeah? A yogi is very vigilant, very sharp. Oh, a little desire has come related to my this one or my that one. Oh, let it come and let it go. No holding on to it. This is vigilance. Yeah? Being vigilant not holding on to desires is worship of the self. Got it? Who will read ahead now? Page 263. I can read it. Uh, Vishishta continued. That is not considered action which with an unattached mind you perform merely with the organs of action. The delight derived from sensual experience is fleeting. A re repetition of that experience does not afford a repetition of the more same delight. Who but a fool will entertain desire for such a monetary joy? Moreover, an object gives you pleasure only when it is desired. So the pleasure belongs to the desire. Hence, give up desire. Okay. This, this paragraph is very, very important. That is not considered action, O Rama, which with an unattached mind you perform, merely with the organs of action. Got it? If my mind is not attached to teaching this particular session of Yoga Vashishta. Yeah? Then this one hour or one and a half hour, however long activity is not called an action. Means I have not created karma. Clear? If there is attachment, Attachment, it is even a little expectation in the mind. You should say thank you, you should like this or you should want something. Even if there's a little attachment in my mind, then this becomes an action and then it is equal to some karma. I will create karma that way. Got it? So anything that you do, if you are unattached, if you have cut those strings of attachment, then that is not an action only. So beautiful, no? Yeah. We always saw that we will, whatever we say, we do physically, 
Yeah, or the thoughts we think are all equal to action. It's all equal to karma. He says, no. The moment you have cut that cord of attachment, yeah, that particular activity is not an action anymore. I will definitely ask you this question in the exam. The delight derived from sensual experience is fleeting. A repetition of that experience does not afford a repetition of the same delight. Who but a fool will entertain desire for such a momentary joy? Yeah. If you realize this, yeah, even if little thing you get, one job promotion, one little award in office, or employee of the month title, yeah, any little thing you get, you feel so you know, happy. How long does that happiness last? Yeah. Two minutes, three minutes, you reach home and your uh, spouse sh starts shouting at you, starts fighting with you. Finish, all your happiness is gone. You've forgotten what happened in the day at work. Yeah. Or your child creates some havoc or some or the other. Neighbor creates some nice scene outside the house. Finish. You've forgotten everything. Pleasure is so momentary. Recognize it. Yeah? And for this momentary pleasure, what you keep doing? You keep running, 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 running constantly. Yeah? Now he takes you one level deeper. Where is this pleasure really happening? He says, Moreover, an object gives you pleasure only when it is desired. So the pleasure belongs to the desire. Hence, give up desire. What is he saying here? Suppose you desire, Oh, I want to buy that house. Yeah, or I want to buy that car. Or I want to buy that dress. Whatever little thing, little desire you have. Only the thought in the mind of possessing that in future is what gives you pleasure. Actually, when you land up buying the house, there is no more pleasure. There is that tension. Oh, now I have to pay the taxes. I have to do this. I have to maintain this. Oh, this is broken. That is broken. I have to call the contractor. And the mind goes on. There is no pleasure in the object really. Where was the pleasure? In the desire for that object. Till the time you were fantasizing, getting that object, there was pleasure. Happened to you? Yes? And you have all realized this? Are you absolutely clear about this? If not, Homework number four, really make a list of all those things where you really observe this. Oh, when I bought that car, this happened. Oh, when I bought that dress. Now one silly little thing you will crave for that new jacket. I don't know what, what anything, a shawl, simple things, those new shoes. What was that, that Apple iWatch, uh, iWatch it was called, no? Whatever, when that came into that into the market. Till the time you did not possess it, there is this running in the mind. Yeah? So, really well, what gives you pleasure? The desire is what gives you the pleasure. Desire for the object. But in reality, when I get the object... Is there pleasure? There is no pleasure. There is no pleasure. In fact, when you get the object, there is only more worry about now how am I going to maintain this object? Recognize this. We had done this long ago in Patanjali. Tapa Dukha. Do you remember? Yeah? What were the three types of Dukha? 
Tapa Dukkha, waiting for something to happen. Yeah? Yeah. Then second, Dukkha, when it happens and you get that thing, what is the second type of Dukkha? Now, I don't want to lose this. Oh, what if I lose this? Oh, if I lose this, this will happen. If I lose it, what will happen? I, I should not lose this. This, this is also Dukkha. Yeah, this is second type of Dukkha. And third Dukkha is, of course, it has an expiry date. Whether it is a house, it is a dress, it is a little object, it is a relationship that expires. When it expires, the third kind of Dukkha is the memory of that object. Oh, that was so nice. Oh, youth was so nice. Yeah. Or childhood was so nice. Yeah, It's gone. Remember we've done this? So really... I, huh? I was... I can see the picture where I wrote my notes for these three months. <laughs> yeah. The last one, some scar look or something like that. I can yes. remember the second one. Yes, yes, yes. Correct. We did it in Patanjali. Patanjali, yeah. Yeah, I think we did it in Chandan's house only. Yeah. You know? So these Dukkha, realize when Patanjali was also talking about them, he's talking about the object is not giving you the pleasure. Recognize this. This is the real truth. The object does not give pleasure. It is just desire in the mind. And what is desire? It's imagination. It's not real. It's only in the mind. It's only playing games in the mind. Yeah. Who but a fool would keep running the race for something which is an imagination. Yeah. So that's why Vashishta advises you drop, drop desire. So that's your homework number four. Recognize that all these objects that I'm running behind, there is no pleasure in them, not at all. Yeah? And drop, drop desiring because it is nothing but imagination. Yeah? You come back to my example of running inside the train. Stop running inside the train. Life will flow. You are not the door. It is all happening. Yeah. We'll go ahead. We'll read ahead now. If in the course of time you attain the experience of that, the self, do not store it in your mind as a memory or ego sense to be revived as desire once again. For when you rest on the pinnacle of self-knowledge, it is unwise to fall into the pit of ego sense again. Let hope cease and let notions vanish. Let the mind reach the state of no mind while you live unattached. You are bound only when you are ignorant. You will not be bound if you have self-knowledge. Hence, strive by every means to remain vigilant in self when you do not engage yourself in sense experiences and also when you experience whatever comes to you unsought, you are in a state of equanimity and purity, free from latent tendencies or memories. In such a state, like the sky, you will not be tainted even by a thousand distractions. When knower, known and knowledge merge in the one self, the pure experiencer does not once again generate a division within. With the slightest movement in the mind, when the mind blinks, the samsara world appearance arises and ceases. Make the mind unwinking, free from movement of thought, by the restraint of the prana and also the latent tendencies, vasana. By the movement blinking of prana, the samsara arises and ceases. By diligent practice, make the prana free from such movement. By the rise and cessation of foolishness, ignorance, self-binding action arises and ceases. Restrain it by means of self-discipline and the 
instructions of the preceptor and the scriptures. This word illusion has arisen because of the movement of thought in the mind. When then ceases, the illusion will cease too, and the mind becomes no mind. This can also be achieved by the restraint of prana. This is the supreme state, the bliss that is experienced in a state of no mind. That bliss which is uncaused is not found even in the highest heaven. In fact, that bliss is inexpressible and indescribable and should not even be called happiness. The mind of the knower of truth is no mind. It is pure sattva. After living with such no mind for some time, there arises the state known as Turiya Aditya, the state beyond the transcendental or the Turiya state. So what happens once you realize that objects or this samsara has no pleasure in it or in other words this samsara is just dukkha and how every object that I run behind first gives me tapa dukkha, the wanting of the object, parinama dukkha, the realization of the object and then the worry that I will lose it or the fear that I will lose it and the third is the samskara dukkha, the memory of that object after losing it. So in totality is it, it is dukkha. When I realize this, when I understand this, that this entire samsara is nothing but objects and objects have no pleasure in them, then I will learn to experience that self, that calmness within. Yeah? Then he warns you, he says, if in the course of time you attain the experience of that, which is the self, do not store it in your mind as a memory or ego sense to be revived as desire once again. Got it? Here in this process, the first step, you realize samsara is dukkha. You dropped desiring. Because you dropped desiring, you started going deeper. You meditated and you became very silent. You experienced that self now. But now what happens after I have one experience? Again, the old tendency of the mind comes back and I want now that experience to happen again. I'm going back to desire. I'm going back to square one. You understood what he's saying? Yeah? With so much effort, you are recognizing this is dukkha. You are experiencing the self. Now don't start becoming feverish about the experience of the self or the experience of meditation or the experience of silence. Yeah? In other words, he's telling you, when you're on the spiritual path, you start developing feverishness on the spiritual path. For the Guru, for the scriptures, for that experience of meditation, experience of silence, that will again become an obstacle and bring you back to step one. Recognize that you experience that self only because you dropped desire. Your first Sudarshan Kriya. I'll give you an example. And you had no idea about what the art of living is and what the Sudarshan Kriya is. There was no desire in the mind also. Correct? So when you did your first Sudarshan Kriya, you experienced such a, a calm state, a completely different state from what you ever had experienced in life. And you experience that calm state only because you were devoid of desire. You had no idea what to even desire. Right? But what started happening after a few more weekly follow-ups? Yeah. Oh, I want to experience that state that I experienced on the first day. That desire itself becomes an obstacle. I am back to square one. Are you seeing this? Yeah. 
that is what he's telling you here recognize that desire is dukkha yeah it gives pleasure it's only apparent it's not real because when i achieve the same object there is no pleasure there yeah so don't start desiring for an experience of the self he says now for when you rest on the pinnacle of self knowledge it is unwise to fall into the pit of ego sense again let hopes cease and let notions vanish let the mind reach the state of no mind why you live unattached you are bound only when you are ignorant you will not be bound if you have self knowledge hence strive by every means to remain vigilant in self knowledge got it you are understanding the word vigilant here again and again just observing oh a desire is coming up yeah it's only coming from a notion that this particular object will give me some pleasure money will give me some pleasure yeah this relationship will give me some pleasure this is a notion because i have this notion that this object will give me pleasure i have the desire to want that object got it so he say drop these hopes and drop these notions let them vanish and then only can the mind reach the state of no mind yeah so don't start seeking when you are on the spiritual path don't start desiring for that experience he say why because it will bind you you are bound only when you are ignorant you will not be bound if you have self knowledge yeah so strive by means by every means to remain vigilant in self knowledge when you do not engage yourself in sense experiences and also when you experience what whatever comes to you unsought you are in a state of equanimity and purity free from latent tendencies or memories so point number 1 he is telling you don't engage in sense experiences oh what does this mean i should not eat food tasting is also a sense experience no don't have that attachment don't do anything out of feverishness when you don't have attachment and don't do anything out of feverishness then you will eat only as much as the stomach is asking have you noticed this when you are really aware you will eat only how much ever this body needs yeah the mind will stop its craving oh one more roti or one more piece of paneer or whatever one more slice of pizza that craving for that extra slice of pizza or paratha that is indulging in sense experiences got the difference also when you experience whatever comes to you unsought yeah i am not looking for it i am not seeking it yeah but it has come my way so i experience it whether it is a good experience or bad experience doesn't matter yeah i just go through whatever experience has come to me unsought then only you are in a state of equanimity and purity and free from tendencies in such a state like the sky you will not be tainted even by a thousand distractions when knower known and knowledge merge in the one self the pure experiencer does not once again generate a division within yeah 
It's a very beautiful state to be in. Yeah, The state that he's talking about even a thousand distractions will not be able to taint you. Now whatever people come with different different kinds of attractions. Oh you know this is something new I bought. Just because your friend bought something then you have this desire oh I want. Have you noticed these little little things? Yeah. He may not even say that I bought this. Yeah? You might just observe that that friend of yours has this new watch or this new little thing and you then generate this desire. This is a distraction. A vigilant yogi who's so steady, who's all the time observing and does not even get distracted by these things. Not that he's unaware or not that he is not sharp, not that he has not noticed that watch. He must have noticed it but it did, did not tempt, it did not kick in that desire. Yeah. So homework number I think four or five for you. What are your major distractions that come into your life on account of friends, family, colleagues, boss, social circle, art of living? What are your major distractions? You write them down. With the slightest movement in the mind, when the mind blinks, the samsara arises and ceases. Yeah. This was the blinking of the mind. In the pool of consciousness, when that little drop said, I, this is the blinking of the mind. The moment I was created, you was created. I jumped out of this and I got lost in the samsara. So it happened in the blinking of an eye, just with the slightest movement in the mind. So he says that is the cause. So what is going to be the solution? Make the mind unwinking, that is free from movement of thought. How? By the restraint of the prana and vasana. Both, he has given you two solutions. Restraining the prana and restraining the vasana. Both. Vasana is nothing else but desire or temptation. Yeah? You restrain both, he is saying. By the movement of prana, the samsara arises and ceases. By diligent practice, make the prana free from such movement. By the rise and cessation of foolishness, which is ignorance, self-binding action arises and ceases. Restrain it by means of self-discipline and the instructions of the preceptor and the scriptures. Yeah, the first one you got, the movement of prana, there was there's movement of prana in the consciousness. From that the I came, from that samsara is created. So he's saying, restrain, learn to restrain this prana. Yeah. So at the root only, I am nipping it off. By restraint of prana, I can stop this movement of mind. And the second solution, by the rise and cessation of foolishness. Foolishness here is nothing but desire. Self-binding action arises and ceases. Self-binding action is karma. So from karma, from desire, karma comes up. Foolishness is desire and self-binding action is karma. How will you restrain it? Restrain it by means of self-discipline and the instructions of the preceptor and scriptures. Nothing is possible without Anushasan. Yeah? Self-discipline. By disciplining the mind. Without effort, it is not going to happen. Remember that. 
If you think just by reading the scripture it will happen, no, that's an illusion. Unless I make an effort to apply what I am reading in the scriptures, it is not going to happen. That's why both he's given you self-discipline and the instructions of the preceptor which are in the scriptures. This world illusion has arisen because of the movement of thought in the mind. When that ceases, the illusion will cease too and the mind becomes no mind. This can also be achieved by the restraint of prana, that is the supreme state. The bliss that is experienced in a state of no mind, that bliss which is uncaused, is not found even in the highest heaven. In fact, that bliss is inexpressible and indescribable and should not even be called happiness. The mind of the knower of truth is no mind. It is pure sattva. After living with such no mind for some time, there arises the state known as Turya Atita. The state beyond the transcendental or the Turiya state. So he had explained this once before. Turiya Vastha is where I reach that state of no mind with self-discipline, with the instructions of the preceptor by restraint of prana. All this leads to this illusionary world of samsara or this maya to vanish as in people will not vanish but I am not ignorant anymore. I am not disillusioned by people, situations and things anymore. I can see clar complete clarity I have in the way I see this world. I see it for what it is. That highest state he says is not even available in heavens. Okay? To experience that state of no mind or Turiya Avastha, you must take a human birth. Only in the human birth, you are in the middle of that dirt of samsara. You are surrounded by this Dukkha and you have the courage to get out of this Dukkha recognizing that it is Dukkha. And then you drop this. When you arise out of that dirt, that muck, when you come out, you come to the first state which is the Turiya state, the state of no mind. And when you are in the state of no mind, continuously, without dropping back into the muck of this samsara, then you attain a higher state which is Turya Atita. Clear? Yeah. So, you start at least walking on the path sincerely. If really there is no self-discipline yet, start now. Yeah, because this is a one-way street. You left a lot of pleasures behind yeah, you, you recognize relationships are dukkha, you recognize money is a dukkha, you recognize friends, family is dukkha. You have already recognized, so there is no way going back. You have reached a point really. Yeah, you've reached a point where many, many people cannot reach. Yeah, though in ahead the journey seems long. Though it seems like, oh my God, first I have to reach Turiya Avastha and then I have to reach Turiya Atita Avastha and still I don't know how many more Avasthas Vashishta is going to come up with. Yeah, that seems like so far away. But recognize this, even when you turn back and look at this samsara that you have left behind, you will not be able to go back. Have you realized this? Sometimes the mind is very tempted. Let me go back, forget it. Kya Vashishta, I'm never going to get this. Yeah, but it's a one-way street. Once you have moved ahead, 
you cannot go back how much ever you really want to. Yeah? So keep walking, keep chugging. This is the toughest part of Vashishta. Yeah? Keep meditating. Go deeper and deeper into your meditation. And you will get there. Yeah? Start meditating longer. Make it a one hour meditation at least every day. Cool? Any questions? When the high rises from the pool of consciousness and it takes different forms. So trees are also getting formed and they also contain jiva. So what happens with their circle of life and death? So they live a longer life. Some trees live thousands of years. Right. That's, yeah. yeah. So they have a very long karma. Their karma in your human years is thousand and two thousand years. Na? In their tree time it is not like that. Everybody has a different time zone. Yeah, you remember we've done in Bhagavad Gita, no? Every loka has a different time zone. So though they appear to be in your Bhu loka, they are not. Their time zone is different. For animals, their time zone is different. Yeah, that is why we say, no, something cats, uh, when they are what, uh, one year, what, our one year is their seven years or something like that. Yeah, so... Every jiva has its own time zone. Yeah? So the same thing happens to trees. Maybe many, many, many thousands of years ago, Rupa was a tree. Yeah? You don't know. Yeah? So you have moved up like that in your evolution. It takes 84,000 lifetimes for a mind to mature to this level to even understand jnana. So, of course, in these 84,000 lifetimes, some few lifetimes we were trees. Yeah. Anybody else has a question? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, when you were explaining the first thing, right, that everyone's, that I came out, Everybody has different dreams in the night, right? Two people sleeping on the same bed in the same room will have different dreams. Like that. Even though you and I are in each other's dream, we are in each other's dream for a limited amount of time. So which essentially makes our dreams completely different from each other. Yeah. So it's very interesting how... You will meet only those people. You will interact with only those people who you have conjured up in your imagination. In other words, created karma. Got it? So, we all have been together in Yoga Vashishta for almost three years now. Yeah? So, we have this three-year karma. And I don't know how long this will go on. Maybe four years. So we'll have we have a four year karma. When that karma expires, our dream, the dream sequence ends. And 
essentially the 15 20 people how many of our people we are to together had 15 20 different dreams just one hour a week of each person's dream is exactly the same got it like that only you have maybe another few hours of dreams with your spouse which are in the same situation then you have a few hours of other dreams with your child your parent family member art of living colleagues boss think about it you know you are sharing this dream with other 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 people it's uh, it's like a multi-dimensional pentagram ah, perfect <laughs> a multi-dimensional venn diagram <laughs> Can you draw something like that and show everybody next week? Uh, I'll try to. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to correlate this, this dream and my dream and reality or my reality with the, with the fact that when this I broke out, Please share your answer with everybody because you've left them in the middle now. <laughs> okay, so what I was trying to say is there is this I which just stepped out, which is me. <laughs> now, uh, my question was there is Ikta's I who has also stepped out, but then I realized that I have created Ikta in my mind. There is no this, there is no as far as I am concerned, there is only I. Right? The moment when I am saying there is someone else's dream, which is also, I can't see their dream. I can see only my dream. Whoever I am seeing is, is a part of my dream. Only when they realize that, okay, they are, that I has also stepped out and this whole thing that they are seeing, their job, relationships, everything, that is their reality moving with them somewhere. So there are infinite people realizing an infinite realities existing at the same time. Perfect. Good, good. Very good. Anybody else has something to share or a question to ask? Take care. Then. All you guys start meditating and may you all reach Turiya Atita very soon. Yeah, And I will see you next week. Yeah, we'll get on to the deeper aspects of what Vashishta wants us to go into. But see that you meditate. To understand all this, you must meditate. Otherwise, it is only theory. Yeah? You make it practical. Keep meditating. Okay? I'll see you next week. Jai Gurudev.